Welcome to life unrestricted. This is your show if you're sick of living a life controlled by food and exercise rules and if you're ready to learn how to accept yourself and enjoy the heck out of life. My gig is about body image, femininity, self-worth and resilience. Come on, let's walk side by side as we slowly step out of restriction misery and unlock our true selves. Your host, Merit Boxler, is a former national radio DJ, freelance journalist, speaker, and writer with a passion to make women feel good in their bodies. This is a show brought to you live from Switzerland. Hey there, lovely radicals. I hope the existential hot tub you're sitting in is bubbling nicely and at the right temperature. And I hope you have been able to shut out some of the diet and lifestyle wellness detox noise that has become the dialing tone of this society. It's not always easy though, is it? Not dieting and learning to become immune to the diet culture messages in and outside of our head is not like deciding to quit smoking. You'll not immediately feel better about yourself and you won't get applauded by everyone around you. And you're certainly not being offered ciggies every five minutes. Stopping the self-harm of disordered eating and eating disorders or constant dieting, that's a lot harder. Dialing back the volume of the internal diet voice in our head, that's hard because that volume dial turns itself up again and again and again because we live in this body-obsessed world where that toxic dial is constantly in the red zone. And hell yes, I agree, it's a real bummer to find out that in order to live sanely again, we have to have our hands on that dial all the time and turn it down again and again and again. It's best to expect that, I think, so that we know what we're in for, because it really does take continuous effort to consciously decide against what our inner gremlin is barking forth all day. And that, I find, sucks. That sucks hard. I mean, maybe it's just me, but if I had a say in the matter, I would want the recovery scenario to look something like this. Starting position, denial. In other words, being stuck in diet culture and diet culture prescribed behavior without even realizing it. Just dieting and body obsessing and over-exercising and food worrying over and over, year in, year out. Then, step one, awareness. In other words, becoming aware of being stuck in diet culture and of engaging in diet culture prescribed behavior. Step three, Freedom, in other words, being aware of the harm and futility of diet culture messages and being cured of it and of all related behaviors once and for all. Bang. The end. And she lived happily ever after. But yes, I have since gotten the memo that liberation from arbitrary rules and societal beauty standards is just as wanting to conform to them a lot of work. It is, I realize, work that really pays off and lets our inside happiness plant grow again as we liberate ourselves, whereas living a dieter's life is the equivalent of hoping to being able to harvest some happiness plant that is not even planted anywhere and running after that imaginary happiness plant for life. Being dependent on comments, being dependent on trying to impress others, being dependent on constant comparison, being dependent on constant competitive thought processes being dependent on any old source of approval for something as fleeting as your appearance. So I get it. This work is worth it. It is so worth it. But can we just acknowledge that it's kind of a bummer that we have to continuously work on something that this diet culture world has stolen from us in the first place? 
that we must continuously remind ourselves that no diet plan, no beauty company, no scale, no gym attendance has any business in trying to make us believe that our self-worth is something that they can sell to us if we are nice and obedient. This fact sucks. That we have to fight for something that we once had before we were programmed into thinking our bodies were projects that we needed to tend to first priority. That we have to fight against our inner gremlin voices that are repeating those learned messages over and over again and that we have to do the work to find out who we really are, what we want to do with our lives, whom we want to spend it with, what our values are, and what we really want to be remembered for. We got sidetracked, and it takes a lot of effort to erase this evil middleman diet culture has positioned between us and peace of mind. This evil middleman called body obsession. And in my dreamy ideal scenario, I would be able to just spot him and turn him out cold. But in reality, I meet the son of a bitch daily. Sorry, but swearing where swearing is appropriate. I don't know about you, but for me, that middleman returns daily, reminding me that I'm totally on the wrong track with this body positivity thing and that all that's going on is a disaster waiting to happen. If you want to know what these inside conversation between Mr. Gremlin and Merritt often sound like, feel warmly invited to listen to episode 27 with Tom Rutledge. We really put that SOB into the spotlight. This in a gremlin SOB, if you know what I mean. But what I want to say with this is that it's easy to think that once spotted, the inner diet mind will just put its tail between its legs and scatter. No, no, no. It will stick around and it takes us, you and me, our daily effort to disobey our own diet minds. It's an active thing. Very unpleasant. But as many brilliant guests have assured me, it will grow quieter, less vicious and less frequent, that voice. And that's what liberation smells like. Stepping out from a torturous, abusive relationship where we just lived by made-up rules, let ourselves be gaslighted all the time, where we thought that somehow what we did would bring us all the cool things in life. When the cool things in life really only come when we live according to our own true heart's desires. When we're authentic when we're living life, when we're experiencing it, its ups and downs, when we're willing to step into vulnerability and recognize that gremlin voice for what it is. It's fear. It's our fear voice. And that it has zero interest in seeing us grow. Because every change is perceived as fear. And you and I know better. We know that change is in fact growth. And that growth happens outside of the comfort zone. Bummer. Personally, of course, I could do without all that constant effort. And there are many days when I still put my own tail between my legs and just blindly believe what the inner gremlin tells me. But it takes one to no one. It hasn't shut up when I obeyed it. But when I obey, I stay trapped. So tell me one good reason why not to disobey your inner gremlin. Whenever you can, do it. Disobey it. Let's put that guy in the backseat and learn how to actually drive our own cars. That's a good place to stop the rant. And before I take you in today's episode, I want to say thank you to Tracy, Karen and Shelby for supporting this show on Patreon.com. Since the start of the year, there have been a lot of cancellations of pledges. I don't know why, maybe because of the political shakiness of the world right now. Whatever it was, I am especially grateful that there are some of you still willing to support this mission with a donation, because you know it. This whole thing only works because of you. 
I couldn't keep this up without your contributions. So thanks, radicals, for considering to become a so-called Patreon. You can check out my podcast site there at patreon.com slash life unrestricted. Thank you. Now, in we jump. In today's episode of the Life Unrestricted podcast, I am honored to talk to Marsha Hotnell from Ludlow, Vermont. Marsha is a registered dietitian nutritionist, and she really has been a voice of reason and a thought leader for the last three decades in helping women move away from restrictive notions of food or health. Since 1986, Marsha has been a guiding force at Green Mountain at Fox Run, the Vermont's women's retreat that pioneered the non-diet approach to health and weight. She now serves as president and co-owner there, and she is passionate about all of her work. She's an accomplished writer who has written hundreds of articles for popular magazines and professional journals, and she has worked extensively to educate the public about nutrition and about the impact of dieting and the internal diet mentality that drives our eating behaviors and obsession with weight. But she's not only president and co-owner at Green Mountain at Fox Run, she is also the president of the Center for Mindful Eating and a former board member of the Binge Eating Disorder Association. So let's jump right in. I really hope you enjoy this conversation I had with her. Hi, Marsha. Thank you for coming on. Hi, Merit. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to be with you. Thank you. That means a lot. And um, we have a lot of time ahead. So let's dive right in. I want to unpack some myths about weight bodies and fat and diets and everything. But before we start with that, I'd like you to introduce yourself to our audience. Let's frame it that way. How was your relationship to your body when you were a kid? Well, from my earliest time, I can remember being concerned about my body size, Merit, because I was um, a round child born into a thin family. And I was born in the middle of last century. Even back then, the thin ideal was alive and well. It was particularly alive and well in my family. Not quite sure why. Anyway, I was always singled out for, for being larger. And it created some significant perceptions in my mind, neural pathways, that led me in the wrong direction eventually. Um, I never really had too many issues around food until I became a teenager, and then I started dieting, and that just led me down a destructive path that um, I came out of, fortunately, but not until I had quite a bit of distress around it. So, but I've been I've been recovered from uh, eating disorder now for over 30 years, so I feel very fortunate with that. Can you remember your first time when you when you went on a diet? Was that pretty early as well, or didn't it start until I don't know high school or so? Oh, it was it was high school. I mean, I I remember certainly much earlier than that, distressing with my girlfriend about we would you know always worry about our weight and. I can even remember the numbers, you know, that I weighed and that we talked about being so horrible, horribly high, you know, which was really not the truth at all. Mm -hmm. But it was in my my last year in high school when I uh, decided I just had enough with being quote unquote fat. I really wasn't that much larger than anyone else. I was just, you know, um, I'm Irish. So if anyone knows the Irish, you know, or many of us, I, I guess I can't generalize that way, but many Irish are, you know, big bust and um, curvy women. And that's what I was. Sounds sexy, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> My husband thinks so. Good for him. So I started, you know, in, in, in senior year in high school with a very extreme diet and um, then went to even more extremes. Was it anorexia that? that no, bulimia. Oh. My mother was also, she, she's the Irish part of my family, and she's also a, a curvy woman. And um, she had struggled with her body image for years. 
So she was always on the lookout for the most recent development in how can I control my weight. And silver she, bullet, yeah. Silver bullet's a good way to put it. Anyway, so she was the one who, who told me about that. And she didn't know what she was doing, obviously. Mm. And I don't even know today whether she knows that I even had bulimia because it's not something that my family is comfortable talking about, issues around body image. I mean, the thin ideal is still very alive and well in my family. So, but uh, yeah, mom told me about it. And I'm the personality stereotype of uh, someone with an eating disorder. I am a perfectionist. I, mm -hmm. I work hard not to let that <laughs> take over too much of my life. But uh, when it came to dieting and, you know, all these efforts, I was pretty perfectionistic. And so, of course, when you are extremely restricting and you, you aren't dealing with anorexia, benching is going to come up, <laughs> you know, as a, what is that called? A, a rebound. Yeah inevitable rebound. And so I would starve myself extremely. And um, then I would binge extremely. And then it was just automatic for me to try to get rid of it. And uh, I did that for about 10 years. So and it's had, you know, some significant health effects for me that I still with, deal with today. What happened? I mean, for many years, I know that I was dealing with heart arrhythmias and these sorts of things. You know, no one knew that I was uh, dealing with bulimia. So I would go to the doctor and they would try to figure out what was wrong with me. And, <laughs> you know, no one knew what was except me that I was uh, doing that. And I've still got a GI distress from it. You know, I'm, my G GI tract is very um, sensitive. sensitive. Yes, very sensitive. And did you never tell a soul about how much you were suffering? I mean, 10 years is intensely long. Yes, no. Mm -mm, no. Oh I, I was full, God, of shame, yeah. full of shame about my body, full of shame about what I was doing. And, and I was, I'm in my late 60s now. So this was before eating disorders were really as probably common as they are today. So, and there certainly wasn't a lot of information out about it. So I didn't even realize that I had an eating disorder, you know, I thought I was just doing one more thing to try to control my weight, you know. I, I think I get what you're saying, because I think for the, for the longest time, what I did, I didn't think about this being an eating disorder or this having a name. In my case, it was exercise bulimia. So I just thought, well, my body is broken and I just need to try harder than anyone mm -hmm. else. And I I want to look effortless and I sure don't want to make this a topic. So I just appear skinny without ever having to deal with it on the outside because I thought that's what everybody else was. And it really took me quite a while to even find a term and the number of people who suffer from this. I mean, this is it's devastating. And yet I, I hadn't known for, for a long time. So I can understand that even in your time, which was a few years earlier, that there was just simply no information around. Right, right. Although, you know, you now hear that so many people my age were struggling with that. So I, I would be really interested to to delve more into the whole history of eating disorders. Oh, I have yeah. done that in my career just to understand better when it all began. And I, I know I heard on one of your other podcasts, I think you were speaking to Virgie, and she mentioned that dieting started a couple of hundred years ago. And so we know that if you diet, you are really increasing your chances of developing an eating disorder. So I imagine they've been around for quite a while now. I think so too. And I think they do also occur with other addictions and problems that we not commonly associate with them. A friend of mine, uh, she told me she had bulimia for a very long time during our apprenticeship in the bank that I once did. So when we were 16 till 19 and then afterwards, and then she sort of switched into 
drugs and then Mm -hmm. alcohol and then the whole thing spiraled out of control she said that when she drank more and did more cocaine then the eating wasn't a problem and then she thought she was over that and and as soon as she tackled one of her addictions the eating disorder came back so it's obvious that there is a lot of suffering that we have our ways of numbing out and if our drug of choice quote-unquote isn't around then we choose something else so we have to kind of address the root issue which is almost never addressed at all when you when you see the medical practices nowadays it's just unless you're skeletally anorexic no one takes notice and you can be anorexic and be at a higher bmi than many people but it just doesn't get recognized and that's that's what kills me Mm-hmm. But, then, you yeah. know, I mean, in the medical community, too, unfortunately, if you are of a, a higher weight, then you are more times than not advised to do what is disordered eating. Exactly. You know, but it's going to raise your chances of developing an eating disorder. Mm-hmm. So the solution <laughs> which if there needs to be one is highly questionable for higher weight is to create ill health for yourself. And, you know, obviously that doesn't work. It's Um, terrible. It's terrible. It's like offering a drink to, to an addict. Right. That, that will eventually cure you. And even I have this experience many times with doctors and especially my, my house doctor, as we say here in Switzerland. When I was 20, she gave me diet pills. And I could have easily gone into an, an addiction of an entirely... I mean, my friends that I had the apprenticeship with, a lot of them went into other addictions like cocaine and smoking a lot. And they all said, well, it, I'm not hungry anymore. I love it. Right, right. Yeah, and that's sort of the common denominator there is that it is really, for so many of us, it is about trying to stay away from food, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and that's one of the things that I like to talk about with our participants here at Green Mountain is that, you know, why does food, why has food become such a go-to for people when they're struggling with emotions or, or whatever it is that they're trying to numb out from, and you know, certainly there are physiologic responses to the ingestion of food that are very calming. You know, it, it does help promote the release of the different neurochemicals that really do help calm us. So food is really meant to, to be a soothing thing for our bodies, you know. But the diet culture has made it off limits. And, you know, what we know about human nature is that when When we are forbidden something, it seems to make it more appealing to us, more attractive to us. Mm -hmm. So you take what is meant to be a soothing aspect, you know, from evolutionary survival purposes of of food, and you just multiply it by a million times with the whole off-limits aspect of diets. And uh, it's just a recipe for food obsession. Yes, of course. And also because it's inevitable that the whole diet culture thing with labeling food as good and bad and making them off limits for us, it also is inevitable that when we eat, we come up with guilt and shame because we always think we oughtn't be doing this. Right, right. And that just adds another layer. Exactly, which is <laughs> the emotional mm-hmm. into that cycle, that downward spiral that... Uh, that really creates problems. And, you know, we talk about eating disorders, but it's really a continuum. People of of emotional eating, and emotional eating is very normal. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it's all about using food to soothe ourselves, and that's a perfectly fine, wonderful thing to do at times, but it's just when it becomes, you know, one of our only ways to take care of ourselves that it starts to create problems. And what you just see is that, yeah, you know, the more people subscribe to this this diet um, culture notions uh, about food, is they just go down that continuum uh, deeper and deeper into into disordered eating. And one of the things that we've noticed at Green Mountain, or I have in particular, because I've been there for so long, I've been at Green Mountain for over thirty years now, and the women who used to come to us, you know, they were 
emotional eaters and they had some distress around that. But, but today we opened last fall a uh, clinic, a therapeutic clinic for women who struggle with binge and emotional eating. And it is uh, over 60 to 70 percent of the women who come to us now take advantage of those services. It's just really become a much, much bigger problem than it was 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, because we have put some very hard emotions onto them. If I feel shame and guilt for eating and I feel like I can't tell anyone or people will ridicule me or someone sees me and points it out to me, that will only make me eat more. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, if, I, if I'm not greeted with acceptance and permission, then this will only spiral out of control. And that's the making of diet culture. I think yeah. emotional eating, as you said, isn't a bad thing. And we all would have this thing more or less under control if we were not made to feel bad about it all the time, which makes us go back to it even more. It's yeah. it's simple it, psychology 101, and I don't, This it's just a profit machine. That's the only thing I can come up with because it's so logical that it doesn't make sense to my my rational mind to see how many people on this planet are infected by this virus. But it is just, they present it really seductively, you know what I mean? Yes, yeah. But, you know, I think it, it does go back to that thin ideal at its basis, even if you take money out of it. And this people want to be accepted. And that is really, you know, people do come in all sizes, mm -hmm. <laughs> all shapes, And that is normal, it's healthy diversity, yet we are given this message that we need to all be the same size. And so it is perfectly understandable that people are going to try to change their size to fit in, to be accepted, if they don't know anything different. Whatever the cost. Yeah. yeah. And that's the issue is that I think a lot of, a lot of women, I think... We're, we're starting to see women in particular waking up that there is something different. There is another way to take care of yourself, to, to fit in, to, to be accepted. And it starts with accepting yourself. And uh, unfortunately, what we're, you know, the, the thin ideal has, has really created a lot of internalization of, of self-hate and body hate. And, and internal uh, fat phobia also. Yeah. Right. Judgment of everybody and oneself included, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, the, the people that you see are the biggest, um, the most biased about weight generally are the people who struggle with it themselves. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about your own healing and what helped you the most. And that ties into Green Mountain at Fox Run and why it is there and the beautiful ingredient of love. So would you enlighten us how you healed yourself? Well, um, you've probably heard this story before. It sounds like it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was actually working out in Los Angeles. And it, it was after I, I'm a registered dietitian. I just finished my internship. Why did uh, you become a, a dietitian? The usual reasons? You wanted to find the magic bullet to stay thin? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, I knew that I had problems around eating, you know, and it's like, okay, you know, educate yourself. It, yeah. it wasn't my first choice in my career. Um, I wanted to be a marine biologist, actually, originally. But wow. uh, when I got caught up in this um, eating problems, I, um, I got interested in nutrition. I thought, okay, you know, learn what to eat, and, and then you'll... Um, You'll, you'll get all things solved. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so I went through my internship and I had my first job and I met a man from France who had written a diet book <laughs> and he was looking to adapt it for, for the U.S. population. And I thought, well, I certainly know a lot about that. And it actually turned out to be a system that actually tried to help people learn how to eat more than what to eat. What it did was really help me start to feed myself again. 
And I also um, developed a romantic relationship with this guy. And so um, that, that social support that I got from him also fed me in another way. So I ended up learning how to eat again, as well as not spend my whole life worrying about what I looked like. And that, that really brought me out of, out of my disorder. We broke up eventually, but in the in the process, uh, well, after I'd, I'd broken up with him, I came east and went to school, but ended up working in public relations down in, in New York and got Green Mountain as an account. And when I came up here, I um, was trying to learn better how to, what Green Mountain did so I could better promote it and ended up falling in love with the son of the owner. And um, that's how I've had my my association with Green Mountain all these years. It was certainly a very good association, too, because I have learned so much that helped me heal my own relationship with food and my body over the years. In trying to share that learning and my understanding with other women has just been um, a tremendous boon to my own healing. So can't say enough about that. It's, you know, being in a community and learning from other professionals who are working in this area too. There, when we when we first started, there weren't too many people, but boy, today uh, there are so many professionals that are working in this area that um, have such good information. So my learning just keeps continuing. Yeah, doesn't it with us all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but how divine of a coincidence is that? meeting your husband at the very clinic that is intended to help people heal from dieting and you found the whole package there. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. yeah, I was very fortunate, very fortunate. And and his mother is the person who had found it in Green Mountain. She was also a dietitian, Thelma Whaler, 94 years old and still thriving. Wow. Um, anyway, she was in her 60s and, and ready to kind of move out of uh, running the business and I was ready and willing to take it on. So it's just, it, it was wonderful. And my husband also has directed the, the business also. And uh, he is a uh, nutritional biochemist and he played a very integral role in both helping women understand um, a lot of the issues around weight, you know, and metabolism and all these sorts of things, but also just being a, a very uh, empathetic male presence in many of their lives in terms of being able to listen to them and, and um, help them. So it's been, a, it's been a wonderful partnership over the years. And talk about Pioneer. I mean, his mother... I mean, I've never heard of a person earlier on promoting non-diet approach. She must have been one of the pioneers. Absolutely. And, and she had this idea back in the 1950s because she had worked in diabetes camps for kids. And she saw the effect that restriction had on these kids' abilities to really make choices in their best interests. So when she saw dieting start to really take over the American psyche, she decided that uh, she was going to found a place where she was going to teach women how to eat instead of starve. And she, she focused on women because it was really a, a woman's issue then. These days it is becoming more of a man, man's issue too, but it's still the predominance of women. And that's, that's who we work with at Green Mountain. It's a special environment when it's uh, all women. Because, you know, men and women are different. And I think it's a very, it's a safer environment for, for many of the women as a result of that. Just how we approach things, how we think about things. And what really is at the root of the issues is often a little bit different, too. So, mm -hmm. so it's been a wonderful place over the years. We've worked with many, many, many women who we still are in contact with. I've seen people come back to us who have came to us 30 years ago. You know, it's it is that non-diet approach. It is it's moving away from all the restriction, but more importantly, it's about learning how to take care of yourself. And it starts with self-acceptance. It starts with saying, "Okay, this is where I am. This is who I am." It doesn't mean that maybe I would feel better or whatever if I make some changes in how I take care of myself. But it's not about me being somehow deficient. 
or there's something wrong with me. It's really more about my understanding of what I want to do for myself and how to achieve it and finding my own path instead of trying to follow all these rules and advice and misguided notions about what self-care really looks like. How beautiful that you're changing life out there in Vermont, really. It's beautiful. And I suppose women who come to Green Mountain at Fox Run, they often probably have never heard of intuitive eating or health at every size. So it must sound almost absurd to their still innocent mind when you propose that permission is going to heal them. So how do you introduce them to your concept? Well, we, we're fortunate in having them, you know, sort of a captive environment. We don't have a fence around the place, you know, they can leave, but they're there to experience something different. And it starts by um, looking at our website and they, they begin to understand that we've got something different to offer. And while they've never experienced or maybe even heard of some of what we do, once they hear about it, it just sounds so enticing that they're willing to try it because for most of them, they've struggled around this issue for a number of years. Some of them, again, are, are older women who have struggled most of their lives around this and they're tired of it. They want another way out. And it, it is less about what they weigh anymore, but about how they live their lives and how they feel and whether they're enjoying their lives. And uh, if you can you know, offer people, I think, a way to really begin to to move away from struggle into enjoyment. It's appealing. The special thing about Green Mountain is that, again, it's immersive, it's experiential. So they're actually experiencing this as they hear us talk about it. And we, you know, we do workshops and all these sorts of things. So they can come to us in very compromised physical condition. We have women with fibromyalgia, women coming in with severe orthopedic issues, different kinds of things like that. And within a relatively short period of time, they're starting to actually feel better. And there is nothing like, you know, feeling what we're talking about. That's where that intrinsic motivation to keep doing it comes from. It's very different from, you know, this knowledge of what, quote, unquote, I should do. It's what I want to do because, boy, this makes me feel good. Then the challenge is taking it home and keeping it going in your life. And the wonderful thing today is that there are so, there's so much more support for keeping it going than there used to be because of people like you with your podcast or uh, therapists and dietitians working in this area or just the whole internet, you know, the different communities on the internet that are really trying to help people move away from these restrictive notions of food and health and self-care and living. And I think living in a world that is, I mean, constantly triggering us on some level, it is important to have the support network ready all the time. I mean, even I, maybe once a day or every every other day, I fall back into some old fears around weight and my body. And then at least now I know the communities I can turn to or the questions I can ask or I can re-listen to some of the episodes of my podcast and a few other podcasts that really help me also. But it's good that we talk about it because I had initially had the expectation of myself. Once I figure this out, I'm going to be easy and immune to all the diety messages out there. Turns out this is not the case at all. I have to deal with it every day. And I have a choice to fall back or to keep going every day, which is great and also shitty because it's really <laughs> hard. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. You know, and those messages are definitely out there. So the support is really important. But but I come back and just in my own personal experience, and it's so much about the messages that we give ourselves. You know, you feel like you have a, a bad day for some reason and you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see and you can really easily go down that path of old thinking that doesn't take you where you want to go. So um, that community, whether it's 
friends in your close environment or online or your podcast or these sorts of things are are really critical, I think, to helping us keep our thinking going in the direction that it needs to go to support us. And how do you help women get out of their decades-long body hate? It's not just one talk or one lecture and then they feel good in their bodies and eat without feeling guilty or ashamed for it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we really try to help women tune into the present moment. You know, the program is very much based on mindfulness. And uh, we started working, I mean, even when Thelma first founded it, it was about being conscious in your life, because mindfulness wasn't a word back in 1973 that at least many people in this country were tuned into. But we started using uh, mindfulness as a core approach back in the late 1980s because we had John Kabat-Zinn, who is the father of mindfulness in this mm -hmm. country, anyway, come up and speak to our participants. So, wow. And it really is about being present in the moment so that you can be better aware of what you know your thoughts are, your feelings are what you need in the moment. And if you can try to keep yourself in that moment, you can make better choices about what it is. But what comes along with that is that idea that I do have the freedom to make my own choices. And that's what non-diet is really about. It is about, you know, empowering the person to figure out for themselves what feels good to them. And, and not just maybe in the moment, but over time also. You have to marry those two things, especially when it comes to food and emotional eating. But it, it's very powerful to try to stay in the moment. The other very important point, I think, too, is this notion of moving away from body hate. And uh, what we do at Green Mountain is, while we love the idea of body positivity, we find that it's really too much of a stretch for many of the women who come to us who are so mired in body hate and self-loathing. The idea of, of standing in front of a mirror and, and looking at themselves and saying, you know, I love my belly, I love my thighs or whatever, it just mm -hmm. totally is foreign to them. And, yeah, and it's... Sure. it's It's not even genuine. They feel, I'll never be able to do that. So what we work on is body neutrality. And it is about just stopping beating yourself up. And even if you never move into body positivity, being able to say, I love my body or I like my body, there is tremendous benefit to be gained from stopping beating yourself up, from stopping all the negative self-talk about your body, to just go to a neutral place. Mm -hmm. So that's really what we try to help. And if you can move on to body positivity, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you can't, you're going to get a lot of benefit out of just being neutral. And, you know, just stopping all the negative self-talk, it frees up your time to go pay attention to other, other things that are important to you. And what if old fears of being not enough come up or fears around letting go of control? I mean, that's something we read everywhere. Just let go, let go of control. And that's the very thing I can't do. It's like, what if I? So we all need someone to just, you know, kind of lead us there and help us there because the idea of giving up control in my mind, my inner gremlin comes up with a disaster. It'll all go haywire. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I will resist the idea of giving up control. Yet, on an intellectual level, I, I realize that giving up control is the very solution. So there are real contradicting forces there. Mm -hmm. For most of our participants, I would say that that is a real fear, especially when it comes to food. And so what we do is introduce structure, and it's very gentle structure that just really helps ensure that a person feeds themselves relatively well to support their body's functioning, both physically and mentally, to give them the guidance that their body is really designed to do about what they need. 
if you're not eating well and you're all out of balance around eating, your mind's going to be out of balance too. So you're going to have a hard time making, you know, wise decisions. Mm -hmm. Now, how what that structure looks like is is extremely gentle. Like I said, it's just about eating regularly and it's about eating balanced, but it doesn't even need to be every meal, you know, has to be balanced or those sorts of things. But you just want to get these this mix of food into your body on a regular basis, that sort of thing. Including and cool foods also like the ones that we have previously forbidden ourselves to eat. Absolutely. Well, you know, a lot of those foods that we've forbidden ourselves to eat are foods that are very basic to nutrition. I'm really talking about, well, these days it's carbohydrates, you know, so it's basic to our body's functioning. Uh, it used to be fat. You know, fat was the bad guy uh, a number of years ago. But all these macronutrients are really critical to our bodies being able to work in the way that they were designed to work. And again, when I say bodies, I'm including the mind. You can't separate the two. So some of those foods are really part of just basic eating well. The other foods that maybe aren't so critical to that from a physical standpoint can be very critical from a, a psychological standpoint. So so we want to uh, learn how to eat those also. And And what we do here at Green Mountain is those foods are regularly included into our, our meals that we serve. We, we serve cakes and cookies and brownies and pizza and ice cream and all these sorts of things, chocolate, because you need to learn how to eat this stuff. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, you will probably end up eating it in a disordered manner because it's we like it. And, and again, food plays many roles in our lives. And uh, when you think about a cake... For example, a wedding cake or a birthday cake are perfect examples of how we celebrate with food. And that's a wonderful way to feed ourselves, you know, psychologically. So we want, we want to leave room for that. We want to learn how to do that again. We were born with the ability to do that, but the diet culture got in the way. Yeah, and they, they labeled all those foods with, you know, guilty pleasure or the sinful this and that. <laughs> and then, of course, this seeps into our subconscious. And then we think, oh, we oughtn't do that or we have to repent for this and stuff like that. So it's it's terrible. And at Green Mountain at Fox Run, you have oh. recently offered a free webinar on the quote, truth about sugar addiction. Right. So um, what did my listeners miss there? Because this is highly, highly interesting how much we have been misled to believe some some stupid stuff about sugar addiction. Mm -hmm. Well, um, actually, your listeners can still get, tune into it uh, on our website. We've got it posted so they could they could listen to it if they want to at some point. And we also have a uh, white paper called Five Steps to Overcoming Feelings of Food Addiction, and sugar addiction fits into that. But it, it basically just starts with this idea that we've been fed for many years that, you know, there are uh, certain elements in food that um, some of us, at least, would be are um, addicted to. And there is no scientific basis for that. This has been looked at a lot. And The only really science that comes out is that people often have, quote unquote, eating addictions. And what we're talking about there is behavior. And what it is, is really, again, very related to what we've been talking about here, is that these ideas that foods are off, off limits and we really have to stay away from them. And so that sets up all kinds of psychological pulls. And then you combine that with the whole diet, restrictive eating. And again, a lot of people these days say that they don't diet anymore, but they, they still very consciously limit their, their intake. Which And is so, a diet. Yeah, absolutely. And so they walk around a lot of times hungry, and then, you know, they get faced with the candy, at, you know, on the neighbor's desk at the office or the cupcake or whatever it is and then they eat it and then they feel bad about it and then they go for more <laughs> you know so it just gets them into that spiral so they end up thinking that they're addicted you know to these these items and it's just it's not scientifically the case the webinar explains this in in much more detail as well as the white paper so if anyone's interested i really encourage you to to look at it. it's in our resources section 
Yeah, I think everybody should know how harmful dieting can be and what it leads to because we only we give diets the credit for our initial weight loss and then the inevitable binge we kind of blame ourselves for. So right. that's yeah. yeah. So how do you how do you explain to someone who has never heard that diets A don't work and B are harmful? Well, one of the best ways to do is to get them to think about all the diets that been on in the past <laughs> mm -hmm. and what's been the outcome of it you know and that sort of brings that message home really quickly because you know many of the women who come to us and I'm certainly many of the women that you talk to maybe even yourself and me we've been on untold number of diets mm -hmm. and the pain associated with it the struggle associated with it and then the outcome of disordered eating and the, the research very clearly shows also is that, you know, over 90% of the people who, who diet or restrict their eating end up gaining back the weight that they lost and 60% of those gain back more than they lost. And you do that time and time and time again and you end up, you know, significantly changing your body um, in the other direction than you want to go. And if you manage to keep the weight down, then you're obviously probably always paying the price of, you know, losing the content of your life, or the meaning Absolutely. of your life. And you're, you end up obsessed, isolated and worrying about food all the time and thinking you are a food addict when in fact you're just deprived exactly. of everything. And you just focused on the one thing and the less it works, the more you focus on it and I paid such a high price, but I was so deeply in this that I didn't realize, like, you know, ever so slightly worse and worse. And you don't really notice, like, the growth of a, of a child. You see them once a year, you go, wow, you've grown a lot. But if you are around this child, you don't see it. And it was just like that for me. It just got worse and worse. My life got smaller and with less meaning. But I, I was so determined to make this work that I was somehow subconsciously okay with sacrificing everything. And so, Mary, what did what what turned your thinking around? Hmm. Wait, um, it was I had to I had to come to a rock bottom sort of place where, in the end, I had been given medication for ADHD, which is. I mean, mm -hmm. let's face it, it's speed, but I didn't realize that at all because I really took them innocently. And then even though I was at a, I mean, at a normal weight and I just had the idea that I had been dieting for 20 years and I had fought for this weight. So I was weight suppressing already really hard. And then I took these medications and all of a sudden within five months, I dropped a significant amount of weight and looked not good anymore, as in, uh, hello, where's the rest of you? And I I was even more obsessed then. So I was even more afraid of regaining the weight. So it was all so twisted. And I was like, but happiness must be around the corner right here. Why? What do I need to do? Do I have to fight even harder? And then I got psychologically hooked on the medication because I thought, oh, my God, I can never give that up. I will regain the weight. And so that made me have a nervous breakdown. I was too weak and I was too stressed out and anxious all the time. And I couldn't sleep at all. And I was just in a very bad place. But I wasn't anorexic as in officially anorexic. I mean, people only took notice when I was pretty thin that something was wrong. But I wasn't thin enough to alarm people. And that's like, wow. Does it really have to get that bad until we get help, until we get heard, seen, that we are really struggling? And then I was in a clinic and I kept on exercising and taking these medications, but I started therapy on all that. And that started opening my mind a little bit. And then I started listening to podcasts and that opened up my mind a little more. And I saw, oops, there's a name and oh, there's others and oh, they are experiencing exactly the same. And all of a sudden, some of that shame lifted. And then last year, I just decided not to take these medications anymore because I really wanted to, you know, set my liver free of these toxins. And I was ready to just give that up. 
and I regained that weight super quickly, but I'm now at the stage that I was before. So I still have a lot of healing to do, but I had to really hit rock bottom until I was able to kind of step back and learn about mindfulness and meditation and who am I and how can I quiet this terribly active mind that was always stuck in the negative and in, in weight fears and in worries and self-hate and judgment. So I think that's what pains me, that I see a lot of people have to have to suffer really bad until they can open themselves up to a new reality or a truth that is actually the real truth and one that supports them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think Green Mountain at Fox Run, had I known about that earlier, like 10 years ago or so, I would have been in the exact right place and not as obsessed yet. So mm -hmm. I'm glad to promote this place. And tell me, how does a typical day look like at your retreat? Well, we have a schedule that has opportunities for learning, you know, psychoeducational types of opportunities, talking about nutrition, um, although more eating behavior than, than nutrition. We just touch lightly on nutrition because that's not usually the issue for the majority of women who come to us. Uh, we have a lot of classes, workshops dealing with emotional eating, body image, stress management, basic self-care. And then we have a wide variety of physical activities that are designed to introduce women to different types of activities that they might find enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And the idea there is, is not to have them working out, you know, uh, all day, but it's just to hopefully help them find something that they're going to want to do when they return home. It's going to help them feel better. A playful approach. Uh, very much a playful approach. It's mindful movement, mindful eating, uh, mindful living. It's all, all about just really finding the pleasure in all of this and understanding that, that pleasure is really uh, what keeps us going. It really is one of the driving forces for uh, survival, that the way that our body was designed was that, you know, if we find pleasure in things, we will go back to it again and again. So if we can help them find the pleasure in all these types of activities of our daily lives, then we're going to be able to better keep that going at home. So it's a, it's a very comprehensive program. We've got registered dietitians, exercise physiologists, and psychologists on staff. And it tries to present this comprehensive immersion experience in living well, looking at you know how you take care of yourself, how you think, and how you can really combine those two things to support yourself in, in living the life that you want to live. Mm -hmm. And you also... Um, at Green Mountain, focus on, as you said, a healthy relationship to exercise. And as you know, my background was exercise bulimia. In other words, I just exercised like a maniac to burn or earn food. And in the end, I was so obsessed, I could not spend a day off or have a rest day. My anxiety would skyrocket and I would be afraid of eating or of something bad happening. And in the end, of course, I lost my period and about a million other things along with that. So what would you tell a woman like me if I came to your retreat? Because there's binge eating, but there's also over-exercising and a total internalized fear of weight gain. So do you have approaches for that too? Well, we do. I'm probably not the best person to talk to you about that because I'm the dietitian in the crowd, you know. Yeah, I will um, talk to one of your specialists. I already yeah. have a date, which is great. But yeah. I mean. It does come down to divorcing physical activity from the idea of, you know, having to pay for what you eat or give you permission for what you eat, but really putting it into the whole recipe for wellness and, and connecting with how good, reasonable physical activity makes you feel. So it comes back to being in that moment. And when we're overdoing it, it doesn't feel good. So it is about connecting, being aware. And again, of course, you know, what 
so many of us that struggle around eating and, and weight deal with is disconnection. We, we aren't connection with, connected with our feelings. So if we can start to bring ourselves into the moment and be aware, then that's really our best guide into what our body needs, as to what our body needs. And when it comes to physical activity, if you're overdoing it again, it's not going to feel good. So that's 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 the message your body's telling you. Don't don't do this. It does not feel good. Now, if you're dealing with somebody who's never exercised, you know they'll say, "Well, nothing feels good to me," mm-hmm. you know. And so that's about uh, starting gently, like you said about play, about movement, about fun, and then you can uh, really start to to find the pleasure in it that way. Yeah, I've totally deleted that from my hard drive some time ago, like joy. Are you kidding? Life's supposed to be earned and suffered for. And I've, I've discovered so many toxic beliefs in my head about stuff having to be earned and joy has to be, I don't know, been suffered for and everything. So it's also important to reveal some of the foundational beliefs we are standing on. Because if it, yeah, if it contradicts them, then we will just fall back. And often my my therapist digs really deep when I bring up my fear thoughts around weight and, and gaining weight and having to gain weight. And she digs really deep. And in the end, I always find myself saying stuff like, what if I'm being left behind? What if no one wants me? What if I, what if I can't make it in life? What if everything will blow up and a catastrophe happens. What if, I, if I'm being rejected and made fun of? What if I'm ridiculed? And so she usually says, well, that doesn't have a lot to do with, with body and weight. It's really my soul, my still hurt soul from, from earlier on being really afraid of, of losing every, everything and really wanting to be safe. And f- having the idea that I find my safety in an obsession, which is clearly not logical. And when she digs that deep, I usually can see how misled I was and that the real issue is the pain that I'm feeling or the fear that I'm feeling inside of yeah. of being rejected. So, right. Yeah, so I would suppose you have a lot of therapists as well at Green Mountain who can, you know, sort of carry or catch someone if they have a really emotional black hole and and feel their emptiness inside? Absolutely. The the program for many years was primarily psychoeducational, Mm -hmm. um, that we, we really spent a lot of time trying to bust these myths and, and help people understand where thinking has gone awry in terms of other beliefs and attitudes about food and their bodies, about exercise, these sorts of things. But as I said earlier, as we saw the level of emotional distress deepen for the women who come to us, it it really motivated us to open a clinic to offer therapy. And again, 60% 60% or more of the women who come to us do take advantage of those services. So we know that it's very much needed. Opening up a lot of this stuff is very traumatic for a lot of a lot of women. And so you can't just open it up and leave them hanging. No, so, surely. Yeah. You know what I ask myself is if everybody on this planet somehow is afraid of revealing their their deep fear of feeling inadequate, no matter how, if it's by dieting or the way we hide and put on facades and disguise ourselves just to somehow, I don't know, for me it came up like, what if everybody sees how inadequate I really am? I got to make up for that. I got to I gotta die it down so that nobody sees it right away. But in, in essence, this is the same thing for people who work too much, who people please, who are perfectionists, who, you know, whatever, really. So is it a human condition to feel not enough? That's what I was just thinking. That I, I think it is uh, to an extent. I think the way that you are taught to believe in yourself probably makes a big difference in terms of how much that fear affects your life. And unfortunately, I think we're 
fortunately or unfortunately, we're only beginning to better understand, you know, our emotional lives in this world and being better able to support our children in developing a healthy relationship with their their bodies and their minds. It just certainly wasn't, I know in my childhood, anything that was ever even thought of. Mm-mm. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah. Just but, be like that or else mommy won't yeah. be happy. Yeah. This is the this is the way to be. And you know, whatever you're thinking or whatever fears or insecurities or whatever, you know, at least in my life that I had, I did not feel any opportunity to discuss those things with yes, anything. Exactly. When I think about it, yeah. you know, I'm constantly talking to my children about those things because I know how important it is. And I think that, you know, more and more people these days do understand that. So, mm. so maybe it's this human condition, but, you know, humans are also, very intelligent, very capable uh, beings. So mm -hmm. we can we can deal with this if we're aware of it. And, yeah. you know, that's what it comes down to so much. It's awareness. It's awareness. Mm -hmm. And seeing that we can create new neural pathways in our brain by committing right. to a new way of thinking or of being more aware of what we are actually thinking. What makes you feel the most authentically you? Um... <laughs> I think it is just trying to uh, stay very tuned in to, to what's going on around me and how I'm reacting to it so that I can respond in an authentic way, mm -hmm. you know, rather than reverting to old patterns. You know, I, I was a, a people pleaser also. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you people pleasers very often don't reveal themselves very much. And so starting to become more comfortable with revealing myself has made a, a big difference for me, I think. It's still a work in progress, though. Yeah, we always are, I think. Yeah. <laughs> How do you yeah. deal with stressful and difficult feelings? Um, I meditate. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've found that to be a really key technique, if you will, for helping me calm my mind. So when I go into these bad thoughts, you know, even I can just come into a very short, you know, being being aware, breathing, it can help me calm myself. But if I can do it for longer periods of time, I can it truly feel the benefits. The interesting thing for me that, and I've just gone through a fairly busy time in my life, that had a bit of stress involved in it. I find that it's harder to do that when I am really more stressed, you know, and when, when you need it the most, it's the hardest to do it. It is. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. when my mind is racing, I'm the farthest away from thinking about meditating. And then usually when I think of it, I'm like, yeah, right. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's not working. And it feels like my mind is actually fighting against me trying to calm it and if uh, I have a good day I'm like ah oh, this feels good I'm doing this for myself so there's this real dichotomy going on I mean it's just probably practicing when you're feeling good and then practicing more and then practicing when you're feeling not so good but still okay and then eventually it'll be possible to do when we are in a bad state but mm -hmm. expecting that from ourselves to be able to do that right from the start, which I did, of course, is insane. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And again, Always. I'm a person who responds to structure. So I find it very helpful to set a time that I'm going to do it, you know. And for me, it's in the morning. is the best time for me before my day gets started and I get distracted by a million other things. So some people respond to structure like that. So it's it can be a, a good technique to use to put that in place. I also find that uh, retreats are very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I went on my first silent retreat, six-day silent retreat this summer, and oh, that was wonderful. <laughs> yes. Yeah, when it's done in groups also, then it's uh, a lot easier. I was with uh, Byron Katie for nine days, and we uh -huh. had a lot of silent periods, and I yeah. loved it. I felt so connected with everybody. But what made the difference for me was that I wasn't alone ha having to face a day full of fears and anxieties and stressful thoughts, but I was surrounded by people on the same path. 
And that mm-hmm. just, you know, it tripled the strength and the grounding that I needed to actually allow myself to participate in the whole experience. And it was mind blowing. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, too, because that is really one of the most valuable parts of the experience at Green Mountain is the other women that you connect with there. Mm-hmm. Because that community that is formed is so powerful, and it does exactly what you talk about. It helps people start to connect better with the message, is understand the experiences, and just really start to feel you know, the difference. So community, whether it's at Green Mountain or whether it's, you know, back in your home environment, is is really a critical part of support for change, for effective change. Yes, it is, especially in a world that teaches us otherwise. So whatever it is, for me, it, it is often online because I'm surrounded by diet people as well. So even thinking about being there for like four weeks at Green Mountain makes my heart open up like, please, please, I want that. Because I can literally feel the the strength that community gives you and that being vulnerable and on the same path, how much this brings us closer to other people and on a real soul level really touches me. So I, I, I think it must be a wonderful experience to be there. Yeah. The program is four weeks long, but you can do it a week at a time, too. And Why and would I? <laughs> I would want to stay and eight I, weeks. It was, it was originally only four weeks long, but then women's lives started changing, so yeah. we had to make it uh, more accessible. Yeah, we've had women, three women who came to our first summer. It was a summer program initially. And then for the next 20 years, they came back every year to be together. Wow. Once a year. It was wonderful. They were wonderful, wonderful friends, and we loved them, too. It goes to show how much trust they have in your place and coming together there. It's almost sacred. If people do that, they show you their love like that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. And are you positive about how the world is developing with bodies and the ideas of weight stuff as in will we reach bottom and then will there be some sanity well i go back and forth Mm, me too (laughs) you know the one thing that i can say again is that when i first started working in this area there were not too many people speaking this message and now there are so many and I, I do think that once a person is ready to hear something different, there's a lot more resources for them now, uh, which is the best hope for change to, to actually occur, positive change in this area. I think, as you said, and, and we see this at Green Mountain quite a bit, is that very often you've got to reach rock bottom before you're ready for change. Mm-hmm. So a lot of things in the world combine, you know, at different times to, to send us to rock bottom. And, and it appears to be more and more that, mm-hmm. you know, the problems are, are rising that are, are creating problems for women. So, so I think, you know, overall, I would say I'm positive. I just don't think in my lifetime I'm going to see, you know, any significant shift but you are part of the change you want to see. And that's beautiful. (laughs) Yeah. You know, actually doing something. And I think it just takes one voice after the other. That's true. So, And it's all these voices that are combining that give me hope. Yeah, it's a beautiful core also, you know what I mean? It is. Yeah. yeah. So how can people find out more about Green Mountain at Fox Run and if they want to connect with you? Well, um, our website is it's greenmountainatfoxrun.com or fitwoman.com. That's a URL that I'm not particularly fond of at the moment, but it's one that we developed back in the 1990s, and it's hard to change at this point. But you can find us on the web, Green Mountain at Fox Run. And I am on Facebook, quite active, social media, on Twitter, under my name, Marsha Hudnall. And, and also Green Mountain at Fox Run. Yes, Green Mountain Fox Run mm-hmm. has a Facebook page and Twitter 
Twitter, and uh, I think we have a Pinterest and an Instagram, all those, mm-hmm. all those things that you've got to have these days mm-hmm. uh, to stay out there. But um, I'm sort of winding down a lot of my day-to-day responsibilities with Green Mountain. I have wonderful staff that is, is picking up a lot of the work that we do, but it makes me a little more available to to talk to people individually and these sorts of things. So invite people to contact me through social media because if you, if you do have any questions or anything, I'm glad to. I'm amazed <laughs> at your work. It's really beautiful. And I'm really looking forward to talk to Anne also about exercise and everything. So I'm delighted that I can give voice to some sanity. It's really beautiful. I'm glad you exist, to be yeah. honest. I think it's time for our final question, and that is, what would you like to be remembered for? Um, it's a good good question, Merit. <laughs> hmm? um, I think probably it's someone who saw a truth in her own life and shared it with others tried to share it with others that saw that it um, it was a truth that was universal and spent her life really essentially trying to help others see that truth also. It's kind of a vague statement, but... Um, I don't think so. I feel a lot of love in it. It is, it is you know, I, I went through so much pain uh, in my younger years and I still see... Uh, women going through that pain and it's it's heartbreaking just even to hear your story it's just it's heartbreaking that 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 women today are going through this and and again increasingly men are too Mm -hmm. so I'm glad that I have been able to be a part of of the change and I'm thrilled again just to see that it growing the voice around this whole whole issue Mm -hmm. well we have so much to thank you for I'm really glad we could have this discussion, and I feel really enriched by it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Merit. And I do want to say again, I just, I love your podcast. I'm subscribing and listening to them, and and I'll support them too. This was today's dose of badassery from Life Unrestricted. Find the show notes with links to everything we mentioned in this episode over at lifeunrestricted.org. And if this show is making you feel good, awesome, make sure to subscribe and please let others feel good too. By leaving a five-star review on iTunes, you'll help make this show more visible and therefore more accessible for others. You're the best. Thanks.